Hello and welcome to Australia in Space TV. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the editor with the Australia in Space magazine and My Security Media. Today we're joined by Dr. Fergus Downey, Senior Engineer, School of Earth and Planetary Sciences or EPS with Curtin University there in Perth. Fergus, thanks for joining us. No worries. Pleasure to be here. Now, we're going to be talking about CubeSats uh, and the Binar program with Curtin University, and you've just delivered three Binar CubeSats to Japan, I understand, and they're about to head their, head head towards uh, the ISS? Yeah, that's correct. So, similar process to Binar 1. Um, Binar 2, 3, and 4 went over to Japan, yeah, it must be just, just over a month ago now. Nice. Um, and yeah, it was a, a great experience. Obviously, with Binar 1, we had a uh, COVID and all that going on at the time. So we had to do the delivery and do all the handover remotely, um, which was a little bit lackluster, I guess. <laughs> you spent all this effort developing a CubeSat only to have to watch it be handled over there and not do it all yourself. It was a bit disheartening. So yeah, it's great to go over there this time and hand them all over in person ourselves. And uh, the, the purposes of, and I've been calling it Binar all this time, but Binar, uh, <laughs> as, as worry, we say. Every, Absolutely everyone does it. So yeah, it's Binar like dinner is what we like to say. Got it. Um, and there's two, three, and four. Uh, maybe explain what they're doing. I take it they're all doing something slightly different? Yeah, so the three satellites are nearly identical except for the payload. Um, and the main payload we have on board them is a CSIRO radiation sensing payload. Um, and essentially the CSIRO has developed two new uh, aluminium alloys. And uh, we're flying both of those on two of them. And then the third satellite is a control. So that one of the satellites just has standard aluminium um, shielding around the radiation sensors, and then two of them have the two different alloys developed by the CSIRO. And they'll be uh, they're going up on a space and a SpaceX Falcon Nine rocket, uh, and then they'll be coming back. How long is their mission? So they'll go to the ISS uh, in the beginning of August, uh, and then they're there they'll sit there for I think it's four to five weeks, uh, pretty similar to what Bin R One was, and how long they were on the ISS for there. Uh, and then once they're deployed, uh, the mission should last at max around six to eight months, given that we're at solar maximum now. Um, so, uh, yeah, so unlike with Binar 1, which lasted 12 months, um, yeah, we'll only have the six to eight months this time. Um, we're hoping to collect some radiation sensor data uh, across all of that, along with uh, a lot of the other sort of secondary payloads that we have flying. Um, so do you, do you want me to go a bit more into those as well, the secondary yeah. payloads? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So we also have three communication systems on board. Uh, one's a UHF system. Um, that's sort of been based on the open source Planet Lab system um, that's been developed by engineers here. Uh, we also have an Iridium communication system, um, which is becoming more common on um, small satellites now for not, I don't want to say real time tracking, but you can get a lot more availability in your communications there. Uh, and then also an S band transmitter, which is developed by a local uh, radio communications group here in WA called AVI. Um, they're specialized in mine site and military communication systems, and now they're branching out to space as well. Uh, and then lastly is a PhD students project, which is the deployable solar panels. Um, I don't know if there's been any good renders going out. Uh, there will be a few soon, but essentially um, two of the panels are double deployable uh, and they rely on compliant mechanisms to deploy uh, and shape memory alloy. So once they get hot in the sun, essentially they should, they'll deploy. And then once they get hot in the sun, they'll straighten out and become the sort of like birds that we're calling them um, that you'll see in all the pictures. And are you, how are you monitoring them uh, during their mission or are they, you know, you, do you have live data or do you get data feeds? Yeah, so we'll be relying uh, quite heavily on something called the SATNOGS network um, for our, uh, I guess, downlink beacon information. Uh, and then, yeah, we have our own UHF ground station here at Curtin, um, which we'll use to do all the um, up and downlink and commanding. Um, so a lot of it will be done there. And then, yeah, we'll rely on amateur radio experts to to sort of give us a bit more information in terms of location and uh, give us some um, health data as well as, as they go around the Earth. And yeah, maybe a little bit about the orbit uh, that they're on and uh, their height. Yeah, so they'll be basically matching an ISS orbit, slowly decaying. Right. Um, so they'll be deployed at about 400 kilometers up, 51 degrees uh, inclination. And yeah, we'll we'll be deployed at the low point in the ISS orbit and we'll slowly, slowly decay from there um, until we burn up in the atmosphere. And uh, yeah, even even aspects of the burn up, uh, how do you kind of measure that? And is there anything left of them at all, or they'll be completely destroyed? No, these these ones will be completely destroyed. Uh, it's a long term target, and it was actually one of the focuses of my PhD is to eventually return one of these satellites um, from orbit. Uh, but yeah, not these ones. So these ones will just purely be uh, 
yeah, brought down somewhere over Earth. We have no control over where that will be, uh, quite likely over the Pacific. But, yeah. What a shame. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it'd, be lovely, it'd be lovely to return something from space one day, but, yeah, not on these ones, unfortunately. There's quite a bit more engineering involved in that and also, I guess, licensing and uh, proving yeah. to bring it down in the right place is one of the main important well, things. Well, sustainable as well. Uh, although uh, I, I did have a conversation just recently with the amount of satellites going up and all burning into the atmosphere, uh, the sort of the impacts. Is there, is there potentially any impacts on the environment? Is, it, is, it, uh, is that measurable at all? Uh, in, in my opinion, I, I'll be honest, I haven't really given um, a lot of research into it. Uh, I think the mass, the general mass of satellites that are in space, obviously it's greatly a lot more than there has been in the past, but it's you know not a lot to still really not a lot in terms of the amount of stuff that's coming through the atmosphere. Yeah, um, we still have more things coming through the atmosphere from you know out of space. So like uh, meteorites and uh, meteors coming through the atmosphere, they're way more common than what satellites are. Um, so yeah, we're definitely not at a stage where we could see huge environmental impacts in terms of what's being returned through the atmosphere. Very um, good. Obviously, the things that do actually come back, they're they're a bit more of concern. So rocket boosters and that sort of stuff that we oh. see washing up on the coasts of, of Australian shorelines or on, uh, in other countries as well. Um, that's probably something that needs a lot more. Um, investigating other than just satellite reentry and that sort of stuff. Well, and the other one is a little bit more on the team. You had a PhD student involved in this as well. Yep. Uh, yeah. How much sort of uh, skills and multidisciplinary approaches were required on this one? Yeah. So Bin our one was myself and two other PhD students who put that together. And now we've, we've finished our PhD and some of them have yeah. moved on. Some of them have decided to stay and <laughs> take on more senior roles. Um, but yeah, this time we had a, a, what must be nearly a three times uh, nearly three times greater size in the team. Um, and then there's two PhD students now who had some involvement on this mission, uh, one more so than the other. Uh, but yeah, the team size has definitely grown up and we've upskilled in many areas, um, namely software development and also thermal modeling and thermal design of the spacecraft has um, leveled up quite a lot. So yeah, we're still uh, building those ex building that expertise and building those skills at the Venus Space Program uh, quite quickly. And I understand even in the undergrads, uh, they're working on CubeSats as well. Yeah. This really advances uh, Curtin University's standing yep. uh, in this particular field. Yeah, so just this year, we've started a new um, program, uh, mainly with the undergraduate students. It's called PAST, um, so Perth Aerospace SmallSat team. Uh, and they're developing their own uh, sort of student-led uh, CubeSat program. So that's side by side with the Minar Space program. Um, so we've been giving them a lot of support and sort of early direction in terms of developing their own uh, CubeSat systems, um, but it's really all led from um, undergraduate students, which has been absolutely fantastic. So seeing the ideas that they come up with and the, the new passion, I guess, that they bring towards space in Australia has been really exciting. Wonderful. And uh, yeah, I suppose that's a good segue into what, what, do you, what do you think that this means for Australian space uh, sort of sector as well and puts us on the map, uh, particularly with the Japanese, but also uh, on the ISS? Yeah, I mean, any any space mission in Australia these days is really exciting. Um, so it's it's I think it's great that we've managed to follow up in our one and deliver uh, three more satellites. And I hope that uh, people can see that and are still really excited about the uh, prospects of Australia and, uh, and its space sector and, and developing it and moving forward. Right. So uh, it's great that this time we've been able to have some uh, closer industry collaboration and actually fly some physical hardware for the likes of AVI. Yeah. I think that's a really promising thing to see that universities can play a role in um, helping develop and test uh, industry payloads. Um, and yeah, I think it's also great that we're performing science and giving the opportunities to PhD students and early career researchers to deliver um, their own scientific payloads and investigate new ways of doing things. I think that's a really, uh, really important thing that Australia needs to be involved in. Wonderful. And uh, what, what's the sort of the, the current plans now for five, six and seven? Uh, is there... Uh, yeah, a, a sort of plan ahead now. Yeah, so there are still a few small things that we'll be tweaking on the one new platform, um, and we're going to have that ready to go. Um, one of the big things we're still looking into is uh, the student-led payloads. So we have high school students that are currently developing payloads in WA. Um, so one of five, six, and seven will fly um, high school payloads, maybe two. Um, so right, we're still working out exactly what five, six, and seven is going to look like. Um, it's in the pipeline, but we're also working on a another new project, which is the the 12U Binar Prospector platform. So um, work has already started on developing the new platform side by side with the, the final upgrades to the one new platform before we can sort of call that, you know, ready to stamp out and keep going with them. So. Nice. Well, mm -hmm. look, uh, this is also, we're going to see you in Sydney next month for CubeSat Plus. 
yes. uh, the innovation workshop with University of New South Wales and ASA. So yep. that's on the 9th to 10th of July. So we'll make sure that those uh, links are in the show notes. Uh, but otherwise, it's great to have Curtin University support as well. And hopefully we'll catch up with you in Perth for the Indo-Pacific Space and Earth Conference. I think uh, these kind of programs, uh, and we'll also be in uh, Japan next month for Space Tide. Uh, so uh, we'll try to link those all together because it's very, very important there from Perth that the work that you're doing uh, really does put us on, I was going to say put us on the map, but it puts us out into space uh, on the International Space Station, which is fantastic. So Dr. Fergus Downey, Senior Engineer with the School of Earth and Planetary Sciences with Curtin University in Perth. Thank you very much for joining us today on Australia in Space TV. Thank you very much, Chris. It's great to be here.